Hello again, and welcome to this session. Um, I'd like to first of all start off with presenting um, the speakers for today's session. Uh, we have uh, Wes Goatley, who is the Program Director, Interaction Design and Visual Communication. You have me, who is Noemi Sadowska, Program Director, Branding and Design Innovation. We have Helga Schmidt, who is Program Director, Graphic Design Communication. And we also have Michal Nazir, who is a student ambassador from the BA Honors Graphic and Media Design, as well as Suki Kurana, who is uh, a student ambassador from BA Honors Interaction Design Arts. And hopefully, maybe Meg will be able to join us um, as we progress. There seems to be some uh, challenges around the technical side. So this we are the um, presenters for today and we'll share with you uh, our experiences as um, teaching teams and learning teams within the design schools to share um, and, and invite you to consider uh, this as an opportunity to, to join the courses here. So um, the presentation is uh, in a form of question and answer. So it's like a discussion between us. So, uh, and I'll pose the first question to Helga. Can you tell us a bit about the London College of Communication, Helga? Um, sure, yeah, sure. Um, maybe let, let, let's zoom out a bit and let me start here. Um, so the University of the Arts is one university, but made out of six different colleges, one of, one of which is London College of Communication. And probably as part of this conversation, you will hear us talking about LCC. So that's the shortcut for us. Zooming out again, so if you look at LC, uh, UAL, we have over 25,000 students from 130 countries, forming an incredibly rich, rich and diverse um, learning community. And this is especially true for LCC. We are a dynamic and inclusive multidisciplinary community of international recognized students, educators, and researchers. So I think what's really important here at LCC is that we are all learning from each other. And um, when we are looking at the history of LCC, so it's going back to like 1894. So it was known as the London College of Printing. And I really hope this is an online open day and I hope it triggers this, that you actually come on site for an open day. You will see this kind of history with us. So we have amazing printing facilities, but not only that, I think our creative technology lab is really cutting edge and 3D facilities. So it's really worth to explore um, what we have on site and to meet with people and course leaders after this. I think we are seeing it as a bit like a, a trigger or right, uh, kind of triggering some interest with you. Um, but before I go further into this, um, maybe I will hand over to Wes and he will talk about what is unique about the design school at LCC. Wes, um, do you think you can tell us more about the design school manifesto? Yes, of course. Thanks for very much for the question. Um, and uh, nice to be able to speak to everybody today. So I'll tackle the first part. You know, the design school at LCC, it, it, the, the LCC itself is broken into three different schools. So you've got the design school, screen school and media school. And uh, in the design school, we have a range of courses, which we're going to get into some more of the details a bit later on that. But just as a kind of an overall, we're in an amazing um, part of London to, to, to begin with, a really brilliant kind of vibrant area of South London, very close to Waterloo and the Thames. It's a really inspiring part of the city to be in. It's very old, quite close to the kind of the heart of it in many senses. Um, but on top of that, the facilities we have here uh, for, for the design school and in LCC in general are top notch, as um, Helga was just uh, discussing, on top of the amazing print facilities and anybody who's into print media of any kind, they're going to have their minds completely blown by the printmaking facilities, old and new um here at lcc but we also have things like the creative technology lab um we have the uh, digital space we have the 3d workshop places where we're experimenting with things like advanced 
um, uh, forms of AI, as well as woodworking, you know, like kind of two rooms next to each other. So this kind of mixture of historic practices, new practices, and, and the blending between them is something that we're incredibly interested in across the design school um, in general. Uh, and really underpins a lot of the work that all the courses do. Um, courses are, are quite often quite medium agnostic and they're really interested in students being able to express themselves and challenge themselves and creatively develop themselves in all these different ways through all these different um, media. And within the design school and LCC in general, there is a lot of um, attention paid to being able to facilitate exactly those sorts of practices in our students. So we're always trying to, to enable people to be their kind of best creative selves. Um, we're both a research institution as well as teaching institution. So many of the teachers who, if you're lucky, you'll be taught by uh, when you join us at LCC um, are things like internationally known practitioners in the spaces that they are working in, for example. Um, we're very fortunate being sort of, you know, arguably and, and ranked very, very high in the world for things like um, arts and design teaching that the world often looks to us to be the leaders in the areas that we teach in uh, here at UAL. And that's exactly the same within the design school that so many of our courses are really built around being the world leaders articulating both what's great about the present of these fields, but also what the future of these fields are gonna look like. And, you know, we're very fortunate to be able to teach and work in a space that provides that sort of environment for our students. Um, onto the Design School Manifesto is a really important part of what we do here at the school and how we kind of orient ourselves both as practitioners, but also practitioners in the world, right? We're always thinking through all of our courses about how do our, you articulate yourself as uh, often a young person kind of like coming into the creative world, but also looking at the changes that are happening throughout the world and thinking about how you have an impact for your practice. So this is how the Design School Manifesto came about. So I'll just quickly break down the points that you can see here. So we believe in design as a site of action and agency to radically transform our world, which means that we're really thinking about how design does have an impact on the world. And we teach our students to respect and think about that, that design, you know, materially impacts and changes how, how the world is. And that's an important responsibility. We believe in the power of design to critique, confront and challenge inequalities. You know, we're always thinking about how we can address the things through the practices that our students develop and through the ways that we build and teach these courses. We're always thinking about how we can allow students to critique, you know, be critical of the things in the world they want to change and that they want to make comment on or draw people's attention to through their work. We believe in questioning geopolitical, socio-cultural and disciplinary boundaries. What this means is we're not just interested in talking about the UK, you know, we're not just talking uh, interested in talking about the kind of narrow spaces uh, that, that we might have come from. We're really interested in talking to and about and around the rest of the world. Um, and through that also about talking about where our disciplines, our creative disciplines cross over with others and how we can think about interdisciplinarity, you know, thinking about crossing our practices over with others to kind of draw the best in of all of those different practices to make ourselves better practitioners. And, and that's what we will be, be teaching you to do. Um, we believe that design operates in an ecology beyond the human centric, meaning that we recognize that it's more than just humans who are impacted by our practices, you know, that the materials we use, we always try to be mindful about their impact on the world, you know, what, how damaging were they to produce, are we being very wasteful in our practices, can we improve that, but also can we design for non humans, you know, can we think about how our designs can benefit other forms of life on this planet than just humans. Uh, we believe that learning is continuous collaborative and creative meaning that all the way through our lives, we as practitioners uh, in whatever form of practice that you're working in, 
you know, being a practitioner means you're kind of always learning. You're never a complete pract practitioner. You've never fully mastered your practice. You're always learning something new. You're always bringing your life experience to what you're doing and learning how to articulate that through your art or design practice. And we really recognize that as being something that doesn't happen on one's own. You know, you're influenced by the people around you. Um, and the world around you. And we build that into both the communities of practitioners that we help develop through our courses, but also thinking again about how these practices impact and work in the, the wider world. Because we think in the design school that that's what makes true creativity. It's about pushing yourself ever forwards, about always challenging yourself, about always thinking about your practice in relation to other people and the rest of the world. Um, we believe in the power of making as critical practice and tangible in uh, making as critical practice and tangible intervention, meaning that we want our making, whatever that making is, to be a form of critique, to be you know reflecting on uh, what we want the world to be um, as the people making these works. You know, we always want the world to be better than it is inevitably you know part of design is that it's a responsibility to others right that might be one of the few things we might want to make a distinction between art and design about were we ever to think that was going to be useful um that art doesn't necessarily have any responsibility to its audience but the thing about design is is that it, that it does in many cases you know a chair covered in nails might be a nice sculpture but it's a terrible chair you wouldn't want to sit on it um, and so design as you know wants to kind of make things that are in some sense useful to the world and useful to people and I think that you know that's by and large a nice kind of rule to think about what we're doing here in the design school is that we we want to be responsible to the world and we want to make it better through what we're doing um, we believe in embracing uncertainty through experimentation and risk-taking you know part of what I was saying earlier about us very much leading in the spaces that we uh, work in and the spaces that we teach in and the spaces that we ask students to intervene in is that we we want to see experimentation we want to see risks taking we don't want to produce really boring safe practitioners because YouTube can do that right you don't need a design school to do that for you if you want to be boring and normal that's where you want to go but if you want to learn how to lead in the future you know that's what we do and um, and that's what we're very proud of to the point that we build it into the manifesto um, the last point here um, we believe in the value of interrogating the past to shape our futures and like i said with the example of having like the woodworking department right next to like the ai department um, is that we are really thinking about the interaction between the long history of our practices and of the world of design and how that informs the present moment and how we lead it forward. Again, talking about just the printmaking facilities as an example, there's these ancient, beautiful um, letterpress um, facilities right next to these incredibly cutting edge digital reprographics facilities and we are and we expect students will often blend the two you know and think about how you use traditional left letter pressing techniques in this digital context and again we you know we're very well provisioned as a school to support that sort of work but mo most importantly is we really encourage it. it's what we want to see from people we want to see uh, the people who leave our courses to be the future of these industries not just a kind of a cookie cutter that everybody else might produce but but we're, we're not happy with and we want you to be part of that leading bleeding edge of these fields um so that's the design school manifesto and as you can tell we're quite passionate about it um so the the next question that um i have i want to actually uh want to direct to uh, nihao um nihao can you tell us why as a, as somebody who chose to study here at LCC, well, why did you do that? What what influenced your decision to want to join us? Right. So uh, I was in my gap year, uh, working on my portfolio for applying to this college called NID in India, when my dad suggested that I look up some international universities. So I literally typed in. Uh, th there's no big story here, but I literally typed in best design universities in the world. And I had UAL pop up on most of the lists and especially on the QS world ranking one. So I thought there's no chance I'm getting in, but might as well apply. I applied and after applying, I was really split between going into CSM or LCC for my graphic design. 
and I did uh, some research and I realized that LCC had a lot of uh, facilities in terms of making practical work. Uh, whereas um, CSM had a lot of theoretical work and uh, me personally, I love to actually use practical methods to create work. So I thought LCC would be the one for me. And after I got in, I spoke to some tutors and um, I was like, this is the best one for, fit for me. So here I am. That's great. I love the tactic of what's the best design school university. Like that's a good, that is a very good Google tactic. And um, yeah, as I said, we we will come up again and again and again in that for, for good reason, both in terms of the reviews that students give us, but also the, you know, official rankings on things like the QS world rankings, as you pointed out. Thanks for that, Nihao. Um, and they, over to Naomi. Um, thanks. Thanks, Wes. And thanks for the uh, very detailed um, outline of our manifesto. Um, I might have to uh, re re uh, review the recording. It was really, really good, uh, well placed. And, and thank you, Nihal, for, for sharing your experience. Well, actually, the next question is for you, Wes. Um, again, can you describe the structure of the design school? Yes, very happy to. So, um, as I said, the, the, there's three different schools, um, screen, media and design, but today we are talking about design and it's the schools that uh, Noemi, uh, Helgra and I oversee. Um, so these are broken down into three programs, which are like three departments, realistically. So you've got branding and design innovation, which is Noemi's program. Uh, which covers um, BA Design for Art Direction, BA Design for Climate Justice, which is a new course and, and you know, very leading in that space, um, BA Design Management and BA Graphic Branding and Identity. Um, with uh, Within the Graphic Design Communication um, Programme, uh, the only BA that um, Helga has to worry about is also happens to be the biggest BA, <laughs> uh, which is Graphic, Media, uh, graphic and Media Design. Um, which is a very uh, long, long running, well-known um, course. Um, and within my program, Interaction Design for visual, uh, and Visual Communication, uh, we've got BA Illustration and Visual Media, BA Interaction Design Arts, BA Service Design, and BA User Experience Design. So you can see across all of those, that there's a lot of sort of granularity in um, what each course covers and there's a reason we have split things up like this is, is because we want to be able to really focus in on these disciplines you know we don't unlike some other schools who effectively don't think about these things in the same way that we do we haven't tried to push graphic design in with illustration for example you know we give both of those courses which are both huge courses for us um, space to breathe and think through those particular disciplines. So rather than being like a kind of a graphic design that's supposed to cover all of those things, we allow them to kind of drill in deeply into their um, practices. You know, much like, for example, the existence of a course like Design for Climate Justice, that's to really specifically think about well, where does design sit within the field of climate justice when all of us are familiar with the Extinction Rebellion logo and the use of design more broadly throughout um, climate awareness topics, you know, we all know the color green is meant to mean sustainable, right? Um, and all of those elements mean that it deserves its own course to get really deep into it. Same with something like uh, the difference between user experience design and service design, which like I say, in another school, maybe they would try to push all these things together. But we're like, no, there is real differences between um, a, a, an approach like service design, which has, has its own history and way of looking at the world, and user experience design. And we want to give um, loads of space for breathing and for drilling into and for people to become real specialists in those spaces when they come and join us rather than learning a bunch of things that they're not super interested in because it's kind of all jammed into one course so that's why we've broken it up in the way that we do and we're really happy with the way that these programs work um so my next question is for Noemi. Um, Noemi, could you please describe a few recent projects from the courses within the branding and design innovation? Thank you, Wes. Uh, yes, that will be my pleasure. So, as you can imagine, with uh, so much, um, so many courses within the program, there's loads and loads of um, really exciting pieces of work that come in every year. 
and um, it was hard to choose. So I just kind of went with course with projects that also showcase to you, um, our audience, um, what types of opportunities come out of uh, studying at uh, in the design school on our courses at LCC. Um, and so I'll kind of give an example from from each course, but at the same time, talk about it in, in slightly bigger context to, to give you an idea why uh, why there's that these projects um, open up other avenues. Um, so I'll start with a, a project from Art Direction, which I thought was super lovely and I really enjoyed looking at during the shows this, this summer. And it was a. It was a publication, it was a book publication that was um, capturing a story of um, a, a student investigating um, her recipes of Indian food. Um, and so it, it, one could say, oh, it just acted as a cookbook. So basically you could go through this um, this publication and, and enjoy the beautiful pictures and the lovely, lovely st uh, pre uh, presented um, recipes and you could use use the book and, and cook those recipes but actually what was super exciting was the way that the book also told the stories of the people who held on to those uh those particular uh, recipes and uh some of the uh, recipes were even drawn on a napkin and that's what the book presented um because it was somebody who might have been a street vendor who had a particular way of preparing street food and that shared that very quickly with with the student because the student actually um went out and uh, obviously they, they were coming themselves from India and went out and collected these stories uh, where, where they had a chance to um, locally in, in India, but not only, they, they've collected a, a, a wide range. And and I think what's exciting about it is is the opportunity to create a, uh, this narrative, this, this uh, beautiful book, but also to capture memories of other people and preserve those as valuable. And I think that's one of the really exciting parts of being part of the design school is this and gaining those um, uh, different tools, creative tools to express um, information in ways that uh, makes them more than just the presentation, just the book. They're more than that. They they celebrate people. They celebrate the world around us and and give it value and and show others that value. Um, the other project that I thought was uh, really interesting and and for for those who are in the room interested in a graphic branding and identity BA uh, probably um, clicks quite well. Um, it was a project uh, called Heap. Um, which was um, a student's um, process of developing a, a brand for spice and herb companies. So they were interested in in kind of where uh, where the spices and herbs were coming from. They did quite a lot of research, finding out that um, the uh, spices and herbs can actually come through processes that quite that are quite contaminated. And so they wanted to set up a company that um, actually celebrated the, the sort of natural resources and sustainable processes of uh, of offering um, spice, herbs and spices and that there are kind of toxin free products. But um, it might seem quite odd to have a, a spice and herb company as a, as a, gr a graphic brand uh, designer, but the, it was about also kind of capturing the brand, um, uh, sort of the, the ethos of this, the, the, the values that the company was uh, meant to represent uh, through the brand. And I think the reason I wanted to share that with you is because the, um, the our degrees are very much also an opportunity to think about what happens once you graduate. And, and you'll be doing so many different projects that often they can become these opportunities for, for businesses that you might wish to set up either on your own or uh, with others. Um, the other project I wanted to, to talk about is um, a, a collaborative project. So we are very big on collaboration and collaboration with students or peers in, in the course, but also setting up opportunities for students to collaborate across courses uh, or across the whole design school. And one of those um, collaboration comes out of uh, in second year, we have a, a unit called uh, professional practices where all the students from the entire uh, school participate and, and take the same uh, the same unit at the same time. And this particular project is a collaboration uh, between uh, design management students 
and uh, students from a gr uh, graphic and media um, design course. So we are kind of, it sits between myself and Helga in terms of programs. Um, and it's a, a, it's a project for uh, beavers, palm, um, drinks. So you actually can go into shops and see the, the, the outcomes of that project on the shelves as, as we speak. Um, it was a, a live project where the uh, beavers farm uh, and Woodland Trust approach um, the college to uh, to do a project with the students, and was uh, it was worked out as groups worked um, across the design school for that uh, for that project, and two groups were chosen uh, from the uh, from the whole second year, whose project uh, whose presentations then went forward to the to the client and and the, then the client ch chose them and in particular one of them to to realize, and what was lovely about it it not only shows. The, opportun the opportunities we get from working with live uh, companies and um, sort of on live briefs with, with companies, but also the fact that there is an opportunity to take it from concept to production, to, to actual realization. Um, and there's always something super satisfying about kind of walking into a space like a shop or, or um, you know, a supermarket and seeing your work in, in real world and, you know, how, how it's being utilized. Um, so my last set of projects is going to be about um, design for uh, climate justice, the, the new BA that we are launching um, in September 2024, so that we're recruiting to now. Um, so if you've got questions about that, please let us know and um, and we'll I'll be happy to answer them because it's kind of close to my heart. Um, as you can imagine, we don't have yet students, so there are no live projects from it. However, I wanted to share some of the projects that students within the design school have uh, created that give you an example of the type of things that you might be doing. Um, so uh, one of them uh, was a, a, is a project um, where a student ex experimented with moss. They used it in 3D, in three-dimensional three spaces. They created spaces that were uh, testing textures of moss and it was like really amazing experience. Um, another project was, um, uh, uh, a May student was looking in, in this in, in particular case because we have an MA in social innovation and sustainable futures um, uh, has been looking in particular about at product life cycle so how do we make sure that the products uh, are uh, produced and, and created in the sustainable ways but then also during the rest of the life cycle of that product they don't create negative impact um, and another uh, project uh, that if you do come on site to an open day, you can see an example of is we had a student who was really interested in using uh, mural paintings to create social spaces that are inviting and inclusive for others. And we have one of the murals in, in one of the classrooms. But um, what, again, is really lovely is, is kind of how can we take our toolkit that we have, like graphic, like illustration, like um, uh, graphic design, uh, and use, uh, use it to communicate these ideas of, of climate justice, of social justice, um, or racial uh, equality. So um, there are different ways that we can apply this uh, within the course, uh, such as Design for Climate Justice, and as, as um, Wes already was making uh, reference to it, it's it's how we creatively tell the story, create this narrative that gives people um, hope as much as it raises the awareness of, of the course. Um, so moving on, so these are my favorite projects that I've shared with you, but moving on to the next program, I'm going to invite Helga now Please, could you describe some projects from a uh, graphic design and communication uh, program? Okay, thank you. Thank um, you. In my case, it's slightly easier because um, as Wes has already mentioned, um, TDC, we only have one um, undergraduate program. So it's the BA in graphic and media design. So it's probably one of the oldest uh, graphic design courses in Europe. And it's probably also one of the biggest. Um, so the size, I think, I don't want to scare you. I think there's something, so just so you get a number, there are probably 150 students in a cohort. Um, but it is what makes it quite special. And I think the name, it's not a typical graphic design course, I would describe it. It's one, it has the graphic element, which, which talks about these kind of tradition, more analog forms. You're playing a lot around with letterpress, screen printing, um, testing, cutting out uh, stuff. 
But on the other side, you also have the media side where we understand it as emerging technologies. So in this course, it is a lot about combining ideally letterpress with virtual reality. And we have the staff team to support you in, in, a, in kind of finding your own journey through this. So I think what's very typical for probably a GMD graduate is describing themselves as multidisciplinary designers because they've been exploring so many different views of, and techniques of design and um, that they have a very rich skill set to then go on to their next journey. Um, to give an example, I think um, Katerina's project, it's called Plastic Vortex, is actually quite nice. Um, so, and it, it aligns also very well with, with our thinking and the Design School Manifesto. So in this project, um, she took a deep dive into kind of ocean plastics and marine deep debris that was caused, of course, by us humans. And what she found, she was found a data set by NASA satellite, which was really the starting point. And this data set it was tracking the movements of microplastics in a densely populated area of the Pacific, Pacific Ocean, also known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Using this set of data, so that's a nice form of right, finding some intriguing material to work with, she created an interactive, she created interactive visuals, including audio and motion, um, and, and turned this also into a kind of augmented reality animation. In addition to this, there was also, and I think that's nice, that's why I picked it for GMD, she also had a supported editorial piece with the installation, which was made using recycled paper printed on RISO. So right, really embedding what we are believing in in the design school with all these kind of different techniques. So the publication offers an interactive AR element, allowing the audience to experience the installation outside of the exhibit without increasing more materials or waste. And looking at the main installation piece, it was really a collection of audio and motion responsive visible visuals using touch designer in this case. Um, so the aim of the project is really to raise awareness of the human impact and plastics upon the ocean. So I think this is really nice of, in terms of setting it in different direction. And um, we are giving space, so there will be opportunities for shows, whip shows, to also um, show your work to the outside world. Um, and I think if you're interested in this piece, we don't have visuals with it right now, but um, DAGMD also has its own website, gmd.lcc.com. And there is a story about her project because she won uh, an internal award, Peter Cunning's Memorial Award, and so you can see some images with it. But probably not only talking about GMD, I also wanted to raise as we are... Um, in terms of as we are a bigger community within the graphic design communication program, but also as a design school. So we are running a critical, critical forum speaker series, which kind of is nested within the BA course, but opens up to all students in the design school. So that's a speaker series on Thursday evening. Um, students and staff are, you know, everyone can suggest speakers they find really interesting and they're invited to talk about their projects for like 40 minutes and then students, it's very casual, you can ask them questions, show your portfolio, start your network and we do had really great moments of where a student, so we had Eddie Opera from Pentagram speaking in New York and a student just kind of showed him her portfolio and they continued the conversation and she got a job and is now working in New York. So there, are, um, I think it's, it's just this what also makes LCC quite special because we are, and especially also a course like BAGMD is tapping into a network, an international one. So there's almost in every big design studio in the world, I would almost say there's always someone from GMD around. So that's quite an amazing resource also for you to tap in. Okay, but so much from me from TDC program. So let's hand over to the third program. Um, Wes, do you want to talk about the projects in interaction design and visual communication? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just going to send a link in, hopefully, for Miranda to share with everybody, um, just to, to preface this. So I wanted to talk about a couple of recent collaborations and um, ways that courses within IDVC, um, the program Interaction Design and Visual Communication, uh, that the courses within this program have been reaching out into the world with their practice to sort of build on what Helga was just saying um, and what Noemi touched on as well, um, is that courses are always really interested in getting our students' work out there. You know, like we want you to be able to graduate and go into fantastic careers and we will do everything possible uh, to help launch that. One of the things we do, for example, um, the course Interaction Design Arts, which is a BA on the IDVC program, um, that it looks at a lot of ludic or playful um, approaches of doing interaction design, of getting humans to kind of like explore objects and explore topics through this, um, which are uh, really um, engaging and challenging and very explorative and, and very uh, multimedia in how they do things. But one of the regular every single year collaborations they have is they have a, a special night exhibition at the Science Museum, which is, for those of you who aren't familiar, one of the most legendary museums in London, which is an amazing um, city already for museums, and is a, a museum dedicated to science communication, to like uh, bringing to publics difficult or complex or interesting parts about the scientific world through, often through designed objects. And so they partner with uh, the BA in Interaction Design Arts to have students respond to different themes that are going on within the science museums, galleries and shows at any one point. The, um, the website that I have linked to, uh, or Miranda has, has sent through for me um, into the chat, which you can click on, is just a few of the, the programs that they've done in recent years. Uh, from 2014 and 2015 at the Science Museum. So the whole cohort puts these incredible works together, working in collaboration with the Science Museum. So they learn how to work with external partners and, you know, the restrictions upon, you know, what can be done in terms of size, in terms of scale, in terms of complexity, you know, thinking about making works for multiple publics. Uh, these are often things that all designers inevitably have to engage in. And, uh, and it's really great to have these kind of live briefs where you get thousands of people coming through the Science Museum in these kind of Friday late events, they call them, where the, the members of the public get to come in after dark into the museum and see it in a new way, in ways they never normally get to. So they had things around um, space. So all of the, the students were all making projects, speculating about the future of space travel, um, you know, making these kind of playful, um, inventive um, pieces of work about speculating what a future toilet might look like on space stations and things like that. Ways that are both, again, funny, playful, explorative, but do also grapple with real science of like, these are things that scientists and designers are collaborating with to try to solve these design problems. Um, another show that they did, if you scroll down through that page, you see the show on sex and sexuality, and there's brilliant um, there's brilliant documentation in these videos for all of these shows, where students are kind of grappling with, in, in very public context, with these interesting questions around sex, gender, sexuality, identity, bringing these interesting conversations very, like, uh, that are of crucial importance to a lot of contemporary discussions to a very, like, international uh, multi-generational um, set of people you know people from all over the world come as tourists to come and visit the science museum and people of all ages and backgrounds come to the science museum so it's this really great opportunity to get um, fantastic um, uh, fantastic backgrounds and, and ideas kind of brought into this dynamic space of sex and sexuality and the, the, the last one on the bottom medicine and bioscience you know, these really interesting spaces for science um, and thinking about what the role of designers is at helping scientists communicate um, their science. It's such a huge problem in, in scientific fields, you know, science communication about how they reach out to publics um, to, to talk about what they've done. Because unfortunately, a lot of scientists are sometimes quite bad communicators, which is where designers can come in in amazing ways to help articulate and promote the work that science scientists are doing and um, this last show in that um, the medical
medicine and bioscience show was a great example of that. Students working with big scientific departments through the Science Museum that often connected with these big science universities to talk about very cutting edge science and help communicate it to these interesting audiences, which is a really great role that we that lots of different courses do. I mean, every course that we've talked about so far um, on, on all three of our programs, they all do this work of connecting and working with the big um, organizations, bodies, spaces in their field, because these organizations are always trying to work with us. You know, we don't need to hunt after them because they see they want to work with UAL. They want to work with our students. We turn down far many more of these organizations. I'm constantly telling big tech companies that, no, we don't, we're not interested in working with you this year. You know, things like that, because we've just we're too busy. We've got too many other really interesting projects going on with other companies, with other organizations, with other galleries. One other that I'm gonna post in here and um, ask Miranda very kindly to repost in for you is an exhibition that just happened for uh, the BA in illustration and visual media. So part of just their kind of work in progress show, they wanted to kind of really get it in front of audiences to really think about, uh, you know, ahead of their final show, before their final show came out, to, to really think, okay, let's get some of this work that we've been doing in front of audiences and start thinking about how that exposure to a really broad set of publics helps think about the effect that our, that our work can have and maybe you know how we use that to feed back and iterate our own practices. So they held this fantastic exhibition at um, the Oxo Tower in London, which is a very famous landmark right on the Thames. You know, fantastic space off campus, um, you know, and they sunk a lot of time and resources and energy. You know, the course teams put in so much energy to make these things happen um, for the students because we care about our student experience. We want them to do so well that we, you know, we organize these things that happen like in the evening, sometimes on the weekends, stuff like that. Our course teams are really dedicated to, to, to giving these um, opportunities. And that show was immensely well attended to. Like I said, it's in a huge tourist footfall area in London. Um, you can see the whole sort of London skyline from the windows of the gallery where, where, where these were all hosted. And these are all the things that every course in the design school does for its students in all these different ways. We're working with organizations like the Design Museum, IBM, um, UNESCO, uh, the Bureau for Investigative Journalism, the BBC. We have so many of these organizations always clamoring for our students. And actually a big part of our roles tend to be selecting the right ones. What are the ones that are gonna give the best opportunities to our students, you know, and how do we bake that into their learning so that this doesn't just become an exhibition that they do, but really part of how they learn how to be practitioners in their space. And I just wanted to draw everybody's attention to those form of practices that always come through and seed their way through um, so many, so much of the scale of the work that we do uh, here at LCC. Um, so with that, um, my next um, question is for Suki, actually. Um, Suki, can you talk to us about why you chose to join your course in the design school as a, as a design school attendee? Um, and describe what it's like to be part of this community. Okay, so uh, the reason that I chose the design school was mostly because of my course, which um, is interaction design arts. So you had given the example of that at the beginning with the science museum and stuff. And initially, I was actually thinking of going into animation because it was something that I have wanted to do since I was a child. You see all of the uh, movies and you kind of get fascinated by it. And I was really, really fascinated by it. So I was like, I'm going to become an animator. I'm going to be famous one day. I'm sure of that. And um, I think after doing foundation and I started, when I started actually animating, I realized that I have a lot more interest than just animation. And I needed a course that could teach me the ability to be someone who can do a little bit of everything and not something very specific that would narrow down my options later on, which is why I think interaction design was something which I was best suited for. And um, as for like the design school community, I know that the professional practices unit was mentioned here as well. So I can talk a bit about that because we have that going on at the moment. The design community is so nice. Like everyone's, I feel like at the moment with 
that unit going on, you get to learn so much from different people and their different backgrounds. You really get to understand what skill sets you need to work on, what skill sets work well for you. It helps you find your own niche as well. So that's something I feel like the design school has really helped with. And yeah, that's I think that's all I can say. <laughs> no, that's great. And again, thanks for make, for helping us make the point of, you know, what we're interested in with our students is not shutting people down or narrowing them down outside of the realms of creativity. It's about getting people into these really focused spaces, but giving them lots of freedom within that, you know, of like saying, well, what do you want to do? What's important to you? What are you driven by? How do we facilitate that within the context of this course? You know, that's such, that's the work that, that we do with every single student across all of the courses that we've been talking about today. And it's something that we're incredibly proud of uh, in the design school. You know, none of us would be, working or learning here if we didn't really love that aspect of it i think and it's um it's a really strong part of what we do um so my next question is for noemi can you please tell us about the responsible design framework thank you wes um and thank you suki as well for for sharing your experience um it, it's lovely to hear kind of in hindsight why we we choose we make the choices that we do um, so just a little bit about the responsible design uh, framework. Um, it was launched in 2017. So it's been with us for, for a bit of time already. Um, and it was set out in particular to provide a structure to inform staff. So those who are teaching in our uh, courses, students, those who take on the, uh, the, the learning and any other stakeholders of the design school's environmental and social design imperatives. Um, in 2017, obviously, um, we were, the world was already talking about climate crisis, climate change, but um, I design communities weren't as um, engaged with these debates uh, as, as maybe they are now, as, as it's, it's more prevalent now. And it, um, the launch of the Responsible Design Framework was a way to address that. It was something that, um, as uh, Wes uh, was so often referring to, is trying to be the leader in the field. It's trying to make uh, make the point that, and you can see it also reflected in the manifesto, that we are committed to re recognizing and thinking through what impact we have in, in the way we teach um, our students, but also in making sure that the students who graduate from our courses have reflected on that and are aware of that. So it's not just about designing better design but and, and creating better design outputs, but also thinking how do these things play out in in the bigger world uh in the real world you know what impact will they have um so the responsible design framework stemmed from the, these kind of these loud calls for for the school to address this need for design education to respond to the eco-social challenges of our time so to to take that head on to to think about what do we mean by climate crisis what do we mean by inequality how do these things come together how do they join up and try to think how does that impact the way that we create, the way that we design. Um, and so the, uh, the the responsible design framework is a, 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 a set of guidelines, if you will, um, that focus on one hand on process. So how do we um, consider design process um, through the lens of being committed to, to reducing our climate impact and to uh, creating uh, outputs that are equal, uh, socially just so that they, they look after and do not discriminate others um, and then look after people. And give people voice in, in general, ourselves as designers, but also uh, those who we design for. And on the other hand, it's also questioning the purpose. Is it always better to, to keep on designing? If we think about the project that Helga uh, talked about, this idea of you know plastics, plastics are everywhere. It's, it's part of human condition. We created those. Um, but questioning the purpose, do we need more plastics in the world, in the world, or do we con reconsider that and actually look for alternative solutions? And that's just one question, which is around materials. There's also all, all uh, sorts of other questions around uh, systems that we might consider, you know, do we need more systems into the world that keep connecting things or explain things? 
um, can we can we do this in a slightly uh, simpler way? Is is the complexity the only way forward? So the the framework, this this um, way of looking at design as a responsibility that's uh, held with designers, but also um, it's something that we as educators need to consider. It helps us look at this idea of how do we make sure that our processes are not create not causing harm. And how do we make sure that the purpose that we put forward these new solutions uh, out there also is considered in that in that uh, lens, in, in that view of not causing harm to others, but also working with nature, um, connecting with those system um, of nature that is uh, that we're part of, that we're not separate of. Um, and here I just wanted to link again to the um, the BA in design for climate justice, because um, in 2017, the, the responsible uh, design framework came about, but five years later or six years later in 2023, we validated a, an, an entire course committed to this. And it just shows our commitment to these uh, these themes as, as sort of central in the way that we think designing should happen in, in, um, in the now day, uh, in today's day and age, but also going forward, that these things are very important and cannot be um, sort of put aside only just so for us to make things pretty. Um, so, so in a way, the, the 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 commitment to these themes, the commitment to these subject areas, and to the commitment of uh, taking responsibility for for the outputs the design has now has sort of manifested itself in this new course. Um, that is sort of super exciting and, and kind of the, pretty much the first one in the world because um, if you search um, design for climate justice does actually come up on Google in any other way but in in, in UAL um, I've done that one so following Niall's um, approach you know what's the best uh, university in the world you know if you search for the course design for climate justice it is the the course in in the design school. So, um, but it has this history, it has this, um, it demonstrates this commitment within design school for, to these themes and to these um, subject areas. Um, but I could talk about this forever, because considering that it's close to my heart, however, we don't have forever. So I will move us on to the next slide. And this question and now is for Helga. Tell us about the research we do in the design school. Um, we've got some some different research centers that um, I, I think that you will share with us. Okay. So actually I will, I, um, the research at LTC is very rich, very, very diverse. And it would probably be very difficult in probably another series of, of two hour long talks, at least for research to cover it all. But I thought, um, for you as thinking about doing an undergraduate degree, I'm giving an example of how we really try to connect. So research is not something where you have to do your BA, MA, PhD, and only then you're starting with this. So we are, we are creating a connection actually right from the start. And one example is um, what we do in, in terms of what's titled under graph, graphic action activities in the GDC program. It's under the GMD Studio Lab activities. And there all, all our staff is kind of developing a project. Um, it's an outside project outside of the, the typical curriculum that they offer in relation to their own research and practice. And here students can sign up all across the programs, BA and MA, and work with the specific practitioner on these projects. So you're right from the start, if you are interested there, over 20 projects on offer, you can dive into research from year one. And um, maybe to give you an example, we just had an exhibition here in October. It was called Windrush 75, Living Legacy. And it was held during the Black History Month. And it was an exhibition here at LCC featuring stories and experience, very personal experiences. Um, of, of academics and also students in relation to the wind to Windrush. The project came out, out of a GMD studio lab and is now expanding. So it's also there's a, a film project that also shown outside. So there was a screening in Packham um, Cinema Studio, and it's kind of now traveling around the world. 
But I wanted to, there was a nice, one of the students on GMD was involved. She was in, in her final year and she was the co-curator for the exhibition. And I sort of give you a quick quote um, reflecting on the project. So that's from Pearl. I really enjoyed working on this project as it allowed me to explore and understand my family history in a, and in a sense created my own family tree, tracing back my grandparents' arrival to the UK from Dominica in 1956 and the things that followed on their marriage in 1957, getting British citizenship and then creating a life here and how that has influenced me to the present day in enabling me to become who I am. My grandfather had his own printing business and used to design and print in mites to parties on his own printing press, which makes me think I got my love of graphic design for him. So there's a lot of gratitude to them also, and this exhibition was my way of paying homage to them and their legacy. So I think that was a really nice example of how a student, right, brought in their own personal story into the research of the design school. Um, and of course, this is a very specific angle. So we do have different research hubs and activities. So there's a design activism research hub, for instance, an experimental pedagogy research group, which Naomi could talk probably extensively and with a lot of enthusiasm about uh, graphic subcultures research comics research um, and and the list goes on um, but probably to hand over and um, also hear from another um, program Wes um, could you tell us a bit more on Super System Studios what you're working on yeah, sure. Thanks, Helga. So Super System Studios or uh, SSS as we find ourselves calling it a lot um, is which has now been linked. Thank you, Miranda, um, in the chat for you to have a look at. Uh, is a research hub and sort of creative studio that we run um, here from inside the design school um, and now from be between the design school and the Creative Computing Institute at UAL, um, where we're bringing in the fact that, as I said at, at right at the start of this talk, um, all of the people who teach at UAL are people typically with. Uh, a notable international practice. You know, the people who have exhibitions or have design work shown um, internationally all the time, you know, kind of constantly um, it, it, all the way through the year. And so we've got this incredible collection of um, famous practitioners who are all teaching in the school as well as making their own work. And they're all people who see teaching as an important aspect of how they do their practice. You know, their practice is something that is embedded in the world and that that's partly why they teach is to kind of spread those things out and watch it kind of ripple out um, further and further. And, and so in Super Systems, we're really thinking about how do we take that expertise of all of these people and connect it with the fantastic works that our students do and do things like exhibitions and collaborations and uh, talks and workshops that connect the expertise and the practices of uh, and the research of our staff and our students together to do these interesting crossover events. So that's been uh, things like uh, various exhibitions we've done for uh, both for uh, in and around the design school, around final shows, but also for uh, London Design Festival, which we were doing shows every year um, on the run up to um, COVID. Um, and we're just kind of coming back into doing that in person again now. Uh, but also we have made publications, have done, you know, uh, writing and invited other practitioners to come in on those publications to, to kind of build more of a culture of research-based practice and practice-based research across BA, MA level and postgraduate level, uh, postgraduate research, PhD, et cetera, into um, a kind of one site. Um, one of the things we've also been doing is running uh, cross school and cross course live briefs um, with organizations such as the Future of Money Foundation, uh, BBC's R&D department, uh, we did a big collaboration with them, um, and most recently the Bureau for, for Investigative Journalism, um, of thinking about how do we um, facilitate really interesting creative work for students who are who really want these kind of 
interesting research-based kind of practice opportunities an opportunity to kind of both bring their intellectual um, lives and their creative lives really together in an enmeshed way that we're so good at here in the design school but doing it in the context of these much more um, kind of public facing contexts like I said exhibitions outside the university and these kind of books that are not meant to be necessarily academic texts and working with non-academic um, organizations so it's really a way of kind of showing that behind the scenes of all these fantastic um, uh, teachers we've got, all these fantastic courses, there's all these practitioners that also spill out and around it, which what's what makes LCC such an interesting creative space to be in, because everybody's making something, you know, whoever you see at any point in the building is always making something. They're always engaged in their practice in some way, like no one's given up. So which is always really creatively energizing as well. Um, so th that's just a brief overview about um, super systems. And again, please have a look at the website that I've linked if you want to know more. Back to you, Helga. Thanks so much, Wes. And as you all can tell, I think we could talk for this forever, right? But I think we want to go to one of the key questions actually for you and also probably more as, as the kind of closing then from our side. And this question goes to Suki. Um, what would you advise prospective students to look for when searching for courses to join? Okay, so when you're searching for courses to join, I think narrow down based off of a few things. The first thing would be what you're interested in. The second thing would be something that you would like what you're interested in first thing would be something you're interested in and something you enjoy doing second thing is something you see yourself doing in about five or ten years and you wouldn't get bored of it third thing is something that would make you money as well because this this thing this kind of like, the world runs on money you need money at the end of the day and if you get if you get money through something that you enjoy doing then it's a win-win um so these are kind of the things that i looked at when i was applying and I looked at all of the things that I was interested in that I narrowed down and came down to I think five courses uh, all of them were in LCC because I was doing foundation in LCC as well so after that I had five options within LCC um, then after looking into that I talked to course leaders now I understand that people who aren't already in the system wouldn't be able to do that but something that could be done is emailing admissions and then asking specific questions so you can understand whether you're what you're interested in is what you're going to be taught on the course this way you have your own understanding beforehand as well so you won't get really shocked when you enter the course um, other than that another way to shortlist I think would be looking at previous open days so there's recorded open days on the website and there's also um, graduate showcases that would be on the website as well you could attend them in person as well if they're happening around the time but that would be something that I would recommend um, so that's for searching for courses and then shortlisting them I guess App applying and everything I feel like there's a lot of resources on the website so yeah <laughs> Super. Thank you, um, thanks, Elga. Um, th yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. I'm just going to invite Beck Miranda into the room. Um, I know she's been with us um, along the ways, but um, it's her moment to shine because uh, it's time for questions. So, Miranda, over to you. Thanks very much, Naomi. I will, I will try to shine. Um, <laughs> so, um, it's just a reminder as well to please pop any questions in the chat um, and bear with us because we'll be working our way through. Um, so I did get a question in and Naomi, I know it's close to your heart and you have talked about it a little bit already, but we did get a question about BA Design for Climate Justice. I was wondering, I, I realise you've spoken about it, but maybe could you tell us a bit more about what you're looking for in a student who might be studying on that course? Um, thank, thanks, Miranda. Yes, I, I can talk forever. It's, it is very, very uh, close to my heart, part, partly because I was involved in designing it. So um, I feel like, you know, part of me is is embedded in, in its learning and teaching. Um, I think what we are looking for is, is students who are um, and applicants who are interested in those themes. Uh, they are interested in some form of uh, being active in public um, space to 
to bring and uh, to raise awareness um, around these themes. Um, and they are they are connected to those themes that, that these are um, important part of what they would like to learn. The course is putting the commitment to climate justice um, and an exploration what that actually means at the center and at the core of delivery. So the the the, the kind of the, the learning around the toolkits like um, through visual communication. So uh, what be it graphic design, be it illustration, be it um, some other form of interaction design um, or you know experience design. Those toolkits come in because we want to create a narrative around climate justice. We want people to understand in the world the value of actually talking about these things, not only because it's doom and gloom and we need to actually start doing something about it but also to create hope for people so there is a need for communication students or um sort of in a in a broader scheme of things um to be able to say something in such a way that uh the wider public the wider audience um beyond the, the the university can engage with and and that's through hope so we we're looking for for students who who are going to be excited to to bring some hope to this not to just say, you know, as I said, doom and gloom, um, and who are also interested in, in creative uh, outputs. So, you know, they are interested in, in drawing or taking photos or creating films or, um, um, you know, sort of making things, going out there um, and making stuff. So, because the, the design part is quite open. It is, our strength is visual communication. So that's the toolkits that we will be learning. But the focus is really to create a story about the course. And, and, and also, what do we mean by um, by equality? What do we mean by climate uh, crisis? And, and how can we make the most of it in a positive sort of way? So that's the shortest answer I could possibly give. That's great. Thank you, Noemi. Um, I have a question. I believe it was it's your forte. So um, it's about a newer course that we have, BA Service Design, uh, and the differences between that course and BA User Experience Design. Oh, yes, um, that very much is um, my domain. Um, and I'm glad to have that raised up. So there's some interesting kind of crossovers between uh, a number of different design fields or rather how they're kind of perceived as, as having crossover. But as I said earlier on, we really think what's about drilling down deep into the kind of specificities of our forms of practice and what our students need and how we want um, students who come out of our degrees with the names of these courses on their CVs. We want the rest of that portfolio to look really exciting and interesting and also really focused around you know kind of what's what the future of those jobs are likely going to need but also what what um employers are looking for right now so um service design as a field is often framed around um a real focus on social responsibility you know it's thinking about service as in servicing people's communities individuals and typically those who have a form of specific need um, so we have an MA in service design as well as a BA in service design. And depending on where you are in the world, um, it's interesting that service design um, is either really super visible as a, as a field or it's kind of quite emergent as a field, meaning that it's kind of people are just starting to kind of recognize it. Um, but that is rapidly changing, which is why we're we're expanding into um, the realm of, of having a BA um, in service design, because we recognize that people are thinking more and more about what their responsibility is more broadly um, as designers. And there are some people who really care about, um, you know, for example, uh, working with elderly people, disadvantaged people, you know, single mothers, um, you know, you know what, what are the requirements of people who don't normally get uh, represented or designed for by mainstream industries. And there's a lot of care that comes into that and so we teach people in within service design to be very sort of interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary, but also being being very thoughtful, being very ethically responsible, but really thinking about how do you um, yeah serve these communities through your design practices rather than just sell them another product. You know what? How do you make things that make their lives better? And we open that space up so it can be a whole range of of um, communities, or even just uh, you know an individual who really needs help who needs you know designers to respond to their needs 
So um, that's a kind of a very brief overview of service design. User experience design, as it as we approach it um, here at LCC, again, um, both at MA and BA level, there's a lot of, of kind of crossover of our attitudes, rather than simply just making apps, which again, you can just do on YouTube in two weeks. You don't need to go to, to um, a BA for that. Um, you really, we're thinking about um, what does it mean to be thinking about the experience of your users and users is is brought out to be quite broad you know we can think about publics and audiences as kind of users in these spaces and what does experience mean is it just how much they like using an app or is it something about you know making designed work that really um you know resonates with people that really genuinely does kind of like benefit whatever system you're trying to design for them again unlike service design that's speaking to a particular need um, often for particular communities, I would say that user experience design rather thinks about what are the kind of more broader practices. If you want to make something that has, that kind of really creates these interesting experiences or dynamic or useful or compelling experiences, regardless of what it is, whether or not it's like a kind of a fun toy or, you know, it doesn't have that sense of responsibility in the same way, but it is thinking about how do we as designers think about the interactions between um, us and our audiences. Um, and how can you make something that, you know, genuinely does kind of touch, move and engage people um, really actively. And um, UX takes some very kind of um, world leading and field leading approaches to doing that. Um, you know, while, while you will learn some skills in app development, you'll also learn skills in like 3D printing and things that kind of are sometimes borrowed from all these different spaces like industrial design and product design. You know, they try to take the best bits of those practices, these places that have always kind of made people to try to, you know, made works that try to be exciting experiences for other humans and try to bring all that into this program that is way more than just developing apps, which again is is not super interesting these days, but it's more about like, how do we really push ourselves forward as both digital and non-digital practitioners? So that's a kind of a, a brief separation between those two courses. I hope that helps uh, the question asker. That's great. Thank you so much, Wes. Um, I have another question about uh, portfolio. So this could be for any of the program directors and also maybe we could hear from the students afterwards as well. Um, so when I apply for a course such as graphic design or uh, graphic uh, branding and identity, would you expect my portfolio application to sh showcase work that relates to the area of design? So I suppose more broadly as well, what are you looking for or what, what should students show in their portfolios? I can go first and then pass on to Helga if, if that's OK. Um, so looking at uh, the kind of the courses within graphic branding and identity, um, uh, specifically or program uh, branding and design innovation as a whole, I think the key is that um, they, they show your ability to create. So I'm quite keen that the, the examples are of different making techniques. So things that you've made like photography, illustration, as I was saying earlier, uh, specifically to one course, but showing that diversity, the variety of things um, that, that you have made. Now, that does not mean that actually what the themes are, let's say, if, if you show a, a series of photographs, that does not mean that uh, you went into a museum and photographed pieces of art and or, or a design that you really love. Um, you can do that, of course, but um, you don't have to. You can actually show your engagement with the world. I think we all probably are very key, uh, very keen, although I will speak on behalf of my program, um, to, to engage with students in conversations about the world that we live in and the themes that uh, flow through that world. Um, sometimes those themes are not comfortable, but we still need to talk about them as designers, because at some point in our lives, we will have to engage with them. And so this is an opportunity to test out how we approach that. Um, and it's it's, What's important then in portfolio is to, to show how can you have that conversation? How, what are the things that matter to you? What are the things that you want to speak about that um, you want to bring with you to share with others that you will be studying with? So it's it's a kind of two layer answer. On one hand, yes, we we want to see that you can make things that you you know you you can engage creatively in some with something that you can show that process but at the same time it's it's that in, that value of of 
you use these techniques and tools to say something, to have a voice, to express uh, your thinking, your your commitment, your values, your attitudes. So it doesn't have to be an example of area of design, but it should show that combination of um, creative process and the the way that you understand the world around you. So over to Helga. Yeah, yeah. And so it's probably not too much to add from my side, but I think it's um, if you're in a position to to do a funda foundation, then it's then it's really get a rate. Then give yourself that time because it's it's a it's a phase of experimentation, playing with materials, diving into this a year before already. So that's always great when students have it, but it is not essential. And um, I think what we are looking for, I think the word curiosity and experimentation are really big. So it's not about the finished polished thing that we are looking for. We are looking for a new testing, exploring things. Um, if you're going for, let's say, graphic and media design, and you're only having photographs in there, I guess there would probably be a question why you're not going to photography or what specifically, what side kind of draws you to graphic and media design. But I'm not saying it's, it's essential, right? I think the lines to draw techniques to courses, I don't think this is the way we are thinking here. Right. I think it's more, as yeah. Noemi was saying, this way of thinking and that you explore, that you search. Why do you want to do a, B, a BA? Right. What 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 do you want to learn and, and look for? So I think don't be too afraid. I think just have a look at, at the website. And what, um, I think what students saying before, if you can meet current students on the course I think that's that's always really good if you can see the shows there's also the online portfolios and how does your work align with what you're seeing there I think that's really important because that's a bit like where you can position yourself and I think I had a moment myself where I was in an MA course where I actually didn't really fit because it was in a way too commercial for me I wanted to be more artistic and it's doing this sort of research where your portfolio could actually sit that is really helpful. I'm not sure if any one of the students wants to say, I'm not sure, maybe Nihal, I don't know, do you want to say something about your portfolio? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, right, so me personally, I'm a person who uh, loves final products, okay? My process usually goes through my head while I'm designing, but you want to get into GMD. Process, process, process. Every tutor I've ever talked to, they love a final, a good final product, sure. But they also like to know how your brain works. So where you started off, what your thought process was, what kind of experiments you did with your work and how it finally became your fi end product, why you chose it. So um, I talked to Ian recently, who is like a head of uh, GMD. And I was with him on a uh, like an in-person open day, and uh, he one example that he gave that you could follow is up to five main projects, and you can have more um your process in that. So something that comes close to twenty slides in your portfolio, and uh yeah, that way uh is a pretty good idea. Again, GMD has its Instagram, its websites. You can go through, look at what work is usually produced there, and that can give you a pretty good idea on um, the kind of work that, you know, GMD likes. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Suki, do you have any insights on portfolios that you'd like to give? Um, well, I think... Um, well, as far as my own portfolio was concerned, what I did was I made one portfolio for everything, like a big one, and then I shortened everything down to the respective courses because I was trying to go for a variety of different courses. I applied to interaction design, user experience design, graphic and media design, and animation. So I had to cover a lot of different things, but essentially it was one big portfolio that I shortened things down from. I agree with the process part. I think that 
everything, even in the creative industry in general, they ask for process a lot. And I've been seeing all of the professional practices talks that have been happening. Everyone really values the ability to be able to see how your mind works, how you came to the conclusion that you're at and where it goes from there, I guess. But I, I don't think I have anything interesting or extra to add. So... <laughs> Yeah, that's really helpful thank you Suki because I know a lot of people will probably be interested in more than one course on this talk so that's really helpful thank you um uh last couple of questions then um so I have an interesting question uh is studio culture encouraged in the design school so perhaps again maybe some of the program directors can answer and then we'll go to the students and see what they think um, say yes 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 yeah. <laughs> Wes go on yeah. no sorry yes 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 is what I was going to say yeah yeah it's massive <laughs> you know and, and we really try to f f ferment it meaning that we want it to grow you know um, and we put we always put a lot of work into building that studio culture within each course each course has its unique studio culture um, you know there's various courses uh, within our programs that have got you know that host film nights and have got you know copy machines in their studios and other such little bits that hint at places where we the students want to spend more time in uh, you know famously um interaction design arts has a sign that on the door it says it's 7 p.m you've got to go home because of the amount of times that they have to force students to to leave because they don't want to um and we're really proud across all the courses in the design school of when people want to spend so much time in and around their studios uh, with their studio mates and chatting with their staff and using the facilities and that's what we want we want people to be in the building as much as possible and feeling like it's their second home lovely thank you very much um Nihal maybe you could talk a little bit as well about working with the other students on your course across the courses of the design school oh yeah so GMD is extremely big it's an extremely because i think when i uh started my when i was it the first year or second year in the start there were around 200 students and so we are split into four groups of 50 students each and uh they reshuffle us every uh year so that we get more perspectives from the other students in our course so yes uh and we have like four studios, uh, at least for the second year, each of which is in a way designed specifically for the projects that you're doing. So you have one room which has like sofas in there and like plants in there where you encourage uh, them more to speak to your course mates so that you get more different perspectives because at the end of the day, uh, UAL, LCC, extremely multidisciplinary. Uh, they love the interaction and same thing when it comes to PPU, uh, like it was mentioned and how I think I'm currently working with um, a student from Rhode Island School of Design who's uh, internationally transferred here, two students from illustration, another student from graphic design. So yes, studio time, uh, talking to other students, everything is highly encouraged. And in my personal opinion, it's very helpful because sometimes your brain can get stuck to one idea and somebody else can give you a suggestion that will just give you a light bulb moment and open a lot of new perspectives up for you. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very much, Nihal. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions that have come in Bear with me. I can see that we're getting a lot of questions about portfolios, uh, specific questions. So what I will do is pop a link in the chat uh, for everyone watching along live. Um, just to have a look over, there's a lot of information on the UAL website, lots of videos as well that give you more information about what we'd like to see in a portfolio. Um, and for our final question, then let me just see what else we have coming in. Um, oh, that's probably a good a good question. Um, someone asked, do I need to have lots of technical skills before I start the course or will I learn these while on the course? Maybe again, if we could go for the program directors and then maybe the students, what they've learned while on their course as well. I think... Um... No, <laughs> you don't have to bring a lot of skills. You will learn them as you as you develop your projects. Um, it, but you 
it it's an interesting question about what do we mean by skills we all bring stuff with us um and i think that's really important to stress um that and and it links to the the to the question of you know what do i bring into the portfolio what do i put into the portfolio um because we we're not empty vessels that you know the the teaching will fill in uh we we don't support this sort of mo uh, model of, of learning we recognize that um students come in with their own stories with their own personal life histories and i think that's really important to highlight is that when when you build your portfolio tell us your story tell us who you are um and so this idea that oh you you know you have to have skills in order to to get onto the course is is not real because on one hand yes you do have skills already you've studied already you have um you you've achieved stuff uh, you have all sorts of skills that that you are bringing in that are not necessarily the, the the stuff that you'll be learning with us but they're already useful because they will help you understand the world around you um so so you, you we value that we 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 want to build and work with you to to let you grow and and become more than you are now but at the same time um we recognize that um there's stuff that you will have to learn and and that those are tools that uh, will help you to create that um expression that you want to get the right expression or you know to tell that that story that you want to tell um but it is it is something that you, we are adding to for you rather than saying oh you're starting from zero so so i for everybody in the room i just want to highlight the importance of feeling really confident about what you're bringing to that portfolio or to us we we really value that um so over to wes and and helga um <laughs> yeah oh, no, go on no go for it, helga Probably just a small note on how uh, how it's taught. So in a way, if it's like technical skills and let's say it's InDesign or it's touch designer or what you want to learn. So what's usually it's the these sorts of things are not necessarily being taught in the classes in your course, but rather so sometimes courses do it, but the but we have a kind of creative technology lab and digital lab where there are these courses. So there's a kind of whole system, it's called the orb, where you can sign up for a huge variety of different courses. And that's a bit like where you individually also choose what you're going to learn. So don't expect we are there and you're in design session one, this will not happen, right? We will show you where the resources are and there are plenty and then it's for you or we make a start introduce you to tools and then it's for you to oh i really want to learn coding we do coding workshop and then you kind of you know pick up on it i don't know um, i think it's probably good yeah where's yeah what do you want to say yeah absolutely and also to remember that we're looking you know anyone can just like learn a skill here or there but i mean as i think Noemi uh, and Helga are both intimated that we're, we're, we're thinking about the people behind the skills. You know, we're thinking like we can teach you extra skills, but we kind of want passion and energy and creativity and enthusiasm and a kind of hunger that we want to see in those portfolios because you can learn skills, but it's very hard to learn those things in, our, in most of our experiences. And so don't be dissuaded if you're like, well, you know, I've got all these really interesting ideas that are kind of spilling out of my brain, but I don't quite have the skills. It's like, well, that's what you would come to us for but like we need those ideas first you know if you don't have any ideas it's then it's this is not going to work um so do even if you're from a background that's not necessarily you know art design adjacent but you really feel that that's where your passion is kind of lying and that's where your creativity kind of desperately wants to go do not feel um put off because you know we have people that at, at postgraduate level it's very common to have somebody who's like you know their ba was in finance or something you know that join us and that the same logic kind of comes through um from uh, at ba level two that we're looking for people regardless of what they studied before we want to see some of that that kind of creative spark in portfolios um so yeah don't 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 be afraid but as as we, you've heard you will learn whatever you want to learn realistically in terms of skills but um, but we just want to see that creative spark in wherever you're going to submit your portfolios. Lovely, thank you. And I will just jump in because we will have to finish. But I do have one last question that I do think is a nice question to end on um, for Nihala and Suki. Um, and maybe this is a bit of a scary question, but um, what plans do you have for after you graduate? 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Right. So I, when I wanted to come into uh, my BA, I was actually going to join UX design because I loved um like interaction and experience design for a long time, right? But I first wanted to do this foundation where not in a foundation, but something like graphic and media, which was a very broad cause. And then, because I've always planned on doing MA. So I wanted to do MA in UX design and uh, BA in graphic and media, just so that I get be the best of both in a way. And yeah, hopefully um, get a job in uh, some place like Netflix first. Uh, I mean, not first, but, you know, eventually, because um, uh, there's this thing called DPS here in GMD uh, and a couple of other courses that I'm aware where I'm trying to uh, apply to one of those companies to get some experience first. And hopefully, if everything works out, yeah, work, uh, get, uh, study everything that I can, and then get a pretty good job. Yeah. Thank you very much. Suki? Um, well, for me, I think I'm going to finish this course, then look into both either doing an MA in, I think, there's a course which is in the RCA and which has interaction design and it's with Imperial, I believe it's like a combined course or something. That's something that I'm looking into or I'm looking into getting a job and then working, but I'm looking for specifically big tech because that's something that I guess interests me. I'm still developing the interest. I'd be, the interest. On. I'd be but yeah, that's something that I'm seeing. I still haven't decided. I feel like this is a very scary question. <laughs> You've, got oh, really time, Suki. You've got time. Yeah, absolutely. As Wes says, you've got time. It's all good. Lovely. Well, I will wrap up there because we're running up on time. Um, I want to thank all the panellists. Um, so the programme directors of the design school and the students that we have currently in the design school as well. Um. I suppose any closing words of wisdom from anybody that you'd like to give? My suggestion would be just take a plunge. What what worse can happen? You will get in and then what? Like uh, Nihal said, you know, somebody asks a question and then here you are. So I would just say, just give it a go. And if you've got questions, um, as Suki was saying, you know, email admissions, they will find their way to the people that can answer those. and. I'm sure Miranda, you you will. Um, if there were questions that we haven't had a chance to answer, I'm sure you you have suggested how how best to provide that information. So, thank you for, to everybody for listening. I guess any other comments? Lovely. Okay. Well, I will wrap up there then. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you very much, everyone listening at home. Um, do check out the course pages for your individual courses as well. That's probably the best way of finding the really specific information. Um, but lovely. I will wish you a very good evening and thank you very much again. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.